and uh, this is week number six, continuing from the fall. And I'm going to go for, uh, I think, like five or six more weeks, and I don't know if I'll pick up again later, but uh, we'll, we'll go for five or six weeks. So just to recap what we've been doing in this series, I've addressed the interpretation and application of Scripture in our changing times. And first of all, we need to understand uh, some presuppositions. One is that the Bible is God's inspired and authoritative word, that it's his message for all times. I guess before that, we can say a basic presupposition uh, that we probably take for granted is that God is alive is. and that he involves himself in, uh, in our lives and in our world. And so he's given us his word. Uh, so another presupposition is that God has spoken and we are to hear and to heed his message. So how we take a message that was written to other people in a different culture, in a different place and time, and find meaning and application for us today, that's the, uh, that's the theme of what this series is about. We want to know how does God continue to speak through these words that were first spoken to other people in ancient times. And I bring up, as I often do, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so to apply the Bible appropriately to our lives, we must first interpret it correctly with reference to the original audience. And this involves understanding such things as how language works, how various literary forms function, how the human authors addressed specific life situations. And determining the original meaning of the text, and that's what we call exegesis, which means drawing out. It's the, the careful study of the historical and literary context to determine the author's intended meaning. We also need to understand the idea of inspiration, that the Bible is divine and it's human, uh, just like Jesus, divine, fully divine, fully human. It's an authentic, true message from God, but it comes to us through weak human subjects using imperfect human language and subject to the limitations of human culture and experience. What I'm doing now is recapping the last five weeks in about five minutes. And so uh, each of the Bible's uh, literary forms has its own rules for interpretation. And those literary forms that I mentioned last time, uh, or a few times ago, are such things as narrative. Uh, telling stories. There's poetry, and poetry is actually what we're going to talk about today and next week. Uh, there are uh, different uh, different people have different lists of genres. You could more specifically within the genre of poetry say psalms, uh, but I'll cover them together. Good morning. Uh, there are proverbs. There are there is the law, and that's what we covered last time before uh, the break. Uh, there's prophecy, there are letters, there's apocalypse or revelation. These are all the different genres. Uh, now, one thing that I introduced in the last part of the series was if we want to look at what does a verse mean, or what does a, a uh, whatever the Bible, maybe a passage says, uh, what does it mean, how do we apply it in our lives, that it's a good idea to ask the four questions of any passage of scripture. So those four questions, they are, I'm sure I put them there for you somewhere. Uh, yeah, on page five, the four questions. And the first one is, where is the passage in the larger story of scripture? And we applied this again last, during the last lesson, we applied this to the Old Testament law. And as I look at different genres, we're gonna apply this to different genres. So the second is, what is the author's purpose in light of the passage's genre and historical and literary context? The third question to ask is, how does this passage inform our understanding of the nature of God and his purpose for the world? And then the fourth question we can ask is, what does this passage teach us about who we ought to be, meaning attitudes and character, and what we ought to do as those seeking to reflect the nature and purpose of God? All right, so that's the recap of what we did last time and now getting into the new stuff. This week's genre is Old Testament poetry. And most people, when they think of uh, biblical poetry, maybe the mind goes directly to Psalms. 
but over one third of the Old Testament actually is in poetic form. And in fact, there are poetic sections in almost every section of the Bible. So we're going to look at specifically the genre of poetry in the Bible. Now, personally, I don't, uh, I don't like poetry, um, which is not say I don't like God's word, but, and it's not something I've chosen to do. It's just my mind, when I look at poetry, there's something in my mind that like switches off or wants to skip it, and that's just me. <laughs> I'm very analytical. I want, when I read something, I want, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Numbers. Um, what's that? Numbers. I want numbers, yeah. Uh, the reason for this conflict is that uh, just my mind, I'm very uh, anal analytical, cognitive, uh, good for being a scientist or an analyst, but for being a poet or an artist, it's really, it's not a good setup. Uh, poetry tends to be less cognitive and more emotive. It deals more with the aesthetic side of life. Uh, it's more concerned with feelings than with logic, with beauty than with argumentation. I like a good limerick, but I think because that's my attention span for poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this makes poetry, though, an ideal genre for expressing human emotions. Joy, sorrow, love, anger, fear, relief, gratitude, and exhilaration. So some features of Hebrew poetry. Uh, its most common structural feature is parallelism, parallelism of lines. We get a lot of parallelism, and once you see these, uh, these features, maybe you've, uh, uh, especially if you've never uh, heard this before, seen this before, this will kind of open your eyes to notice new things in the Psalms. So one type of parallelism is synonymous parallelism. It, if you look in, looking for my Bible, we're going to be referring to Psalms, uh, so if you have your Bible with you, that's, that'd be good. Uh, but some verses, Psalm 89, <laughs> and I think I gave it on the handout. This is an example of synonymous parallelism. So Psalm 89.1 says, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Now, the analyst in me looks at those two lines and says, you basically repeated yourself right there. Uh, exactly, that's it. That's synonymous parallelism. Parallelism. The, the one basically is a repeat of the other, but stayed in a different way. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will, take, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. Similar thoughts. There's also such a thing as antithetical parallelism. If you look at Psalm 1827, it says, you save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. This comes up a lot in the Proverbs as well. When you read a proverb, there's uh, that antithetical parallelism. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. There's also developmental parallelism. The second line will develop or elaborate on or complete the thought of the first line. So an example of this is Psalm 80, verse 8. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. So the second line is parallel, and, and it, it develops the first line. So there are these different parallelisms to see in there. Um, uh, any thoughts before I continue? Oh, it's amazing. God created poetry in a way that could be translated from one language to another. Yes. Um, <clears throat> And yet, uh, what you'll find, especially in the next on page two, <laughs> is that uh, sometimes you just can't po uh, you just can't translate it that well. But yeah, all these things that is interesting that all, all these the parallelism, other features that I won't get into, like uh, hyperbole, for example, it translates well from one language to the next. Okay, pa page two, acrostic. Now, this is something that unfortunately does not translate well from one language to the other. Um, okay, someone want to read that for me? Because I sure can't. <laughs> Acrostic. So, this is a use of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, if you look in your Bible, Psalm 119, like not on the page but, that I gave you, but actually in your Bible, it's Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, the longest psalm. It is uh, 176 verses, but if you look at Psalm 119, it has uh, eight verses, and it says Aleph, and then another eight verses, Beth, 
Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, and it goes on like that for 22 different sections. Now those little parts, the, those are Hebrew letters. They are not part of the original text. That's just something that the English editors put in so you would have a sense of what I'm about to teach you. Acrostic, the idea of that in poetry is that each line starts with a certain letter, and oftentimes, like in English acrostic, they spell something. Uh, now, if you look at this Hebrew that I've written out for you, these are, I, I haven't done the whole Psalm 119. I've only given enough to give you a feel for what's going on, just 32 verses, so four sections of eight. And, oh, one thing you need to know is that Hebrew leads, reads from right to left. And so, if, that's important for this one. So, if you, yeah, if you look at down in the first octet, the first uh, stanza right there, every one of those, and they're just squiggles, it looks like to you and me, but that's the Hebrew letter Aleph, you notice that, read it from right to left. So, the first letter in uh, every one of those first eight lines is the same thing, and that's the letter Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The next letter is Bet. And you see the next uh, group of eight all start with the same letter. That's Beth. Okay, the next letter is, uh, is Gimel, and the next is Dalit. And so it goes on like that through the 22 different sections. So the writer of Psalm 119 was writing this wonderful, uh, almost like a love poem about God's word, about how wonderful God's word is. And there's something neat about using this, uh, this invention of, of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, uh, to, in such an artistic way to show that uh, God's word is good. So just a neat little acrostic. Thing. That is the, the biggest example of acrostic in the Psalms. Some other Psalms have acrostic in them. Uh, there are three Psalms, I can't remember which one's off the top of my head, but where the first, there are 22 lines, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and the first line starts with the first letter, a lip. the second line starts with the second letter. So it's something that doesn't come across at all to in our English Bibles or in any other translation, but it's just kind of neat to see. No, I can't read that. Okay, any, any questions on that? Okay, so have you ever wondered why the Aleph Beth Gimel when you're reading uh, uh, Psalm 119? That's it. Okay, that's enough of the Hebrew. And I have just, by the way, taught you everything I know about the Hebrew language. There it is. I taught them everything I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, figurative language is another feature of Hebrew poetry. Now, there are many types of figurative language. I don't go all into it. Uh, one of them that I didn't mention is hyperbole, uh, using exaggeration. Uh, but a very common one is similes and metaphors. Uh, examples of both are in, let's get away from Psalms for a minute, in Isaiah 40, 6 through 7. Simile, before I get to that one, similes and metaphors, just the difference. Uh, to say God is like a fortress, or to say God is a fortress, uh, that's simile and metaphor. The only difference is similes use the word like, or as. It is as this, or it is like this. Metaphors do not use the word like. Other than that, they are the same thing. The two have essentially the same meaning, whether to say God is like a fortress or God is a fortress. There's something about God, maybe his strength, his ability to defend, that is like a fortress. Um, just as a side note, I think rhetorically, metaphors are stronger. They come across more strong. Uh, it seems to come across more powerfully rhetorically to say God is a fortress than to say God is like a fortress, but they basically mean the same thing. So God is not literally a fortress. Uh, you know, it, it's a metaphor. It's figurative. Uh, examples of both simile and uh, metaphor are in Isaiah 46 through 7. It says all men are like grass, and there's your simile right there and all their glory is like the flowers of the field, another simile. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. And that's a metaphor right there. So within that, the simile of men are like grass, and then surely the people are grass. There's simile and metaphor. Look at these metaphors from Psalm 22. I think I've uh, gone through this psalm with you before. Me too. Uh, Verse 6, I am a worm 
and not a man. Well, he is not literally a worm. It is a metaphor, a very strong metaphor. Many bulls surround me. This goes on to verses 12 through 14. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. And you see all the metaphor in there. I am a worm and not a man. This is also hyperbole, maybe. Uh, many bulls surround me. There were no actual bulls surrounding him. Uh, if there were, they would have been eaten by the lions, I guess, in verse 13. <laughs> roaring lions tearing their prey. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Well, how did he write that? You know, so it's not literal. These are strong metaphors. He is emoting here. Another, uh, oh, any... Any uh, thoughts about similes or metaphors? Personification. When inanimate objects are given personal attributes. Isaiah 55.12. I didn't write it down for you. But uh, Isaiah 55.12 says, The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. So inanimate objects being given personal attributes. Um, trees don't have hands, they have branches. But <laughs> okay, so um, any thoughts on that? Any questions? Okay. Let's talk about now the nature and function of the Psalms. There are in our Bibles 150 Psalms. They are, oh, before I continue, I want to make sure, I'm reading off of two sets of notes, and I want to make sure I'm not skipping anything important, okay? 150 Psalms, they're arranged in five books, each ending with a doxology. So I want you to see this, uh, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to Psalm 1, and maybe you've never seen this before, I don't know. Uh, but they are arranged in five different books. So if you look at Psalm 1, and it starts at the very beginning, and this is not a part of the original text, but it says book one, and then it says Psalms one through 41. So somebody later along came along and arranged them into five books, and each one of them ends with a doxology. So uh, the first book goes to Psalm 41, and we go to Psalm 41. We're gonna whiz through Psalms very quickly. So you turn to Psalm 41, and at the very end of its verse, so this is within Psalm 41, and yet it's a doxology to the whole book. It says, so Psalm 41, verse 13, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. And then there's book two. And book two, it says, goes to, from Psalm 42 to 72. And I'm going to keep my finger in Psalm 41, and then go to the end of Psalm 72. In Psalm 72, verse 19, which sounds just like that last verse I read, says, Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And it sounds a lot like, it's a doxology, just like the last verse I read, 41, verse 13. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. And in Psalm 72, verse 20 says, This concludes the prayers of David's son of Jesse. Okay? Now we go on to book three, and it says down there in my Bible, which includes Psalms, yours might not say it, but mine does, Psalm 73 through 89. So I go to the end of Psalm 89. This is just kind of neat to see. The Psalms are not just random and sporadic. They are arranged like this. Psalm 89, verse 52, says at the ending, Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. So there's this parallelism in each of those uh, doxologies. Uh, book four says 90 through 106. So let's go to 106. Mm -hmm. Those like those choose your own adventure. <laughs> okay. And at the end of verse uh, Psalm 106, page, uh, verse 48, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say amen. Praise the Lord. And then the last book, the fifth one, 
ends at the end of Psalms. So at the end of Psalm 150. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Kind of neat. So the five books that the Psalms are arranged in. Um, the five books are probably meant to recall the five books of the Old Testament. So the Old Testament law, five books, uh, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. And so it is likely, we don't know for sure, but it is likely that the Psalms were arranged five books, so that there would be five books of Psalms. Most of the Psalms have titles and superscriptions, little things written at the top, and those were not part of the original text. Uh, 73 of the Psalms are associated with, with David in the Hebrew text. If the attributions are correct, you know, they say this is a Psalm of Moses, a Psalm of David, uh, then most were written during David's reign, and that would be between 1010 and 970 BC. Although they range from the time of Moses, which goes almost back to about 1500 BC, to the return from the exile, about 500 BC. So these Psalms range uh, about 1,000 years. Now what's important for interpreting and applying the Psalms is identifying the particular type of psalm and its original purpose. Uh, now there are these different types of psalms, and where are we? On uh, Okay, the bottom of page three. The first type is praise psalms. So pray, psalms of praise. And some examples are, and, and I list them out for you, some prominent examples. And what I'd like to do is just uh, read some of these so you can get an idea for what does it mean, praise. So Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Start busting out the song. Okay. <laughs> you have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praises because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. <laughs> so it's a psalm of praise. And when I read uh, the Bible to my children, I love picking out uh, these psalms, just a psalm of praise to God. Uh, psalm 100, we all turn to it, but that's another favorite of mine, these psalms of praise. There are uh, other types. There are lament psalms, psalms of lament, and these are the most common. These are cries to God for help in time of danger, pain, and sorrow. Uh, they may be individual laments, and so uh, I'll turn to, let's see, probably Psalm 3. Let's just go with the first one. And you, you feel what a, what a very different tone this has than the last one that I just read. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O oh Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry out. And he answers me from his holy hill. And I'll, I'll just stop there. But you can tell the different tone. It is still giving all uh, worship to God and praising God, but there is lament behind it. Uh, Psalm 6, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in anguish. My soul is or in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord, how long? And it continues there. So sometimes when we read the Psalms, the anger, the emotion may seem shocking, but it's an honest expression of the psalmist. He's venting to God. Uh, and so sometimes they are individual laments, like those two I just read in part. Sometimes they are corporate laments. Psalm 12 is an example. Um, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. And this is more a lament maybe of a people, of the Israelites, than of an individual who's crying out to God. Any comments? Okay. 
I had a question back yeah. um, in the section before where it said uh, superscriptions or titles are not a part of the original text. Yeah. Were you referring to the part that says this is a Psalm of David or this is to be Correct. on the... Yeah. And those were not part of the original text? Yeah, so David... Yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, so, so David did not write a Psalm of David, son of Jesse. I mean, we do that now when we write songs because you want... Uh, but when did they appear? I mean, there's, there's things in there that say on instruments we don't even know what they are. Right. Uh, I don't... I don't know the history of that. Uh, I'm going to give you a gut answer that is probably could be right. Um, <laughs> I blame everything on the Masoretes. So, <laughs> you know, so whenever somebody, they did a lot, the, the, the Masoretes, uh, I think 8th or 9th century AD, uh, did a lot of uh, just basically preserving the text. And it might have been them. There is an answer. I just don't know it. <laughs> like, it, it's the kind of thing I go home and look up. Right. Um, I don't know the answer, but someone somewhere along the line, I'm going to blame the Masoretes, uh, blame, give credit to, uh, put in such things as in Psalm 12, for the director of music, according to a uh, word that I don't know what it means, Shemineth, uh, a Psalm of David. Uh, but they, as far as we know, weren't part of the original text. Yeah. But as far as like the book one, book two, that's been by an editor. Of yeah, and, and again, I don't know who uh, arranged them. The Psalms are arranged uh, in, you know, they, they're certainly not in chronological order of when they were written. Uh, they're arranged in order of some, you know, uh, Hebrews, Israelites, somewhere along the line, maybe the Masoretes, uh, give them credit for everything. Uh, but somebody arranged them into those books in the order that we have them. Uh, interestingly, the Septuagint, which is the the pre-Christian, so we're talking third century BC, uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament. They don't have exactly the the, the right order. They, I think, they combine two psalms so that the psalms are misnumbered. Misnumbered, I shouldn't say that. They're not numbered the same way that our psalms are numbered. So I think uh, if I want to read Psalm 119 and I want to go to the Septuagint, the Greek translation, I have to remember it's Psalm 118 there. Right. So, you know, throughout history, they've been organized a little differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Thanksgiving psalms, gracious response to God's goodness or help. And there's some overlap here. You could say these are psalms of praise. Uh, and maybe some might put that in as a sub as a subcategory of praise psalms. But these are specifically Thanksgiving. So they could be individual psalms. For example, uh, Psalm 18. Wow, that's got a big uh, prelude to it. Of David the Serp, the, for the director of music of David the Servant, the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of the song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, and now the actual psalm begins, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God. I'm sorry. Yeah, my God is my rock. There's your metaphor. In whom I take strength, refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it goes on. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. And you can go on and read that on your own, and he goes on about how God... Uh, how God helped him. So it's a thanksgiving psalm. And these are sometimes individual psalms of thanksgiving or sometimes corporate psalms of thanksgiving for all the Israelites. Okay, what else do you have? Uh, we have another category, wisdom psalms. These are directed to other people, other human beings, to instruct them in godly living. I like how psalms begins... I think it, it's notable and uh, most likely purposeful that Psalm 1 starts with how to live a good and wise life. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wis uh, wither. Whatever he does prospers. And that, that's about half of it right there. Uh, that's not a psalm of thanksgiving. It's not specifically a psalm of praise. It's certainly not a lament. It is something written to, 
to the pe people who want to live good lives worshiping God. And then you can see I gave you the other examples there. There's also salvation historical psalms. These look back at great, God's great acts in history. For example, the exodus from Egypt when Moses led uh, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, another psalm looks at Gideon's victory over the Midianites. Those are such things as Psalm 78, Psalm 105. I'm going to turn to Psalm 78 right now. Psalm 78 starts with, O oh, my people, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. You zoom on to verse 5. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. You go on to verse 9. The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law. And if you go on and read that, you see references to miracles in the land of Egypt. It talks about manna in the desert. And so uh, that, that's a good one to read. Uh, about, verse 51 talks about striking down the firstborn of Egypt. So this would be a, uh, in the category of salvation and historical psalms. So the idea here is by remembering what God has done in the past, we gain confidence and hope for the future. And the last category is royal psalms. These were composed for court occasions uh, in the line of David in the Davidic dynasty that celebrate the king that God has placed on Israel's throne. For example, Psalm 2. Starts with, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand. And the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. You go on to verse 7. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. It's songs such as this that were meant to be sung in the court. Now, uh, these royal psalms, they may they sometimes called messianic psalms because they point forward prophetically to the coming of Messiah. Now, when I read those verses, you might have, uh, what came to your mind is when it was quoted in the New Testament. So these Psalms that were talking about the king that the Lord has put on the throne, it's also referring to uh, Jesus, the king, the great king who would arise from David's line. So these are royal Psalms, but also known as messianic Psalms. So there's your examples of Jesus in the Old Testament. Any questions on that? I think it's interesting that um, Jesus talks with a lot of these poetic, um, uh, I don't know what to say, uses. Like, you know, he's like a, someone who builds his house on the sand, or you, know, you see the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't see the plank in your own, the hyperbole, and yeah. uh, things like that. And just seeing how much you know, he was an Israelite and this was his literature, yeah. and then how he spoke it as well. It seemed like I read somewhere that they, Jesus quoted more from the Psalms than any other source in the Old Testament. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was thinking about um, why. Yeah, you know, wh why the Psalms, why the poetry, um, and, and why quote from them. They are, uh, you know, songs. We, in our culture, we quote from songs, at least I do. You know, they are memorable things. Uh, you can remember jingles from the 60s. You know, you can remember jingles from a long, long time ago, but can't remember, my goodness, you know, where you put the car keys. Songs, uh, whether they are musical, they stick with, I'm not going to put any in your head right now, but <laughs> they stick with you really well, and they're not going away. Um, but uh, things that are not in song, we have trouble remembering. Um, it's been suggested that, you know, the acrostic, the uh, a psalm that starts with Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, you know, the 22 letters uh, of the alphabet, it's been suggested that 
maybe the psalmist wrote that so it would be easy to memorize. Uh, and I don't think that's true. Uh, I think that's what I consider a, a culturally prejudiced view, meaning that's the kind of thing that we look for now. Like, oh, that's simple, that's nice and easy to memorize. But I don't think the psalmist who was writing was thinking to himself, I need to write something with letters so that people will be able to memorize. You know, I don't think the psalmist cared that people would memorize it. And besides, they were much better at memorizing things back then than we are now. So whereas we appreciate a good poem that's, you know, something that if you need to memorize, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, it doesn't seem like that would have been necessary or useful. So I want to know, uh, do you have a favorite psalm? Uh, is there any one that is specifically meaningful to you? Because um, I want to stop talking for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Any song that you particularly like? Too many. <laughs> yeah, they're all good, I know. Yeah, but any, anyone in particular well, jump in. 1, 8, 23, 150, 100. <laughs> I love Psalm 19 just because it, it speaks of the Word of God. And, well, first it starts with the creation, how he just reveals yeah. the God, and then, and then how his Word also it converts our soul. Yes. So I, it just reminds me, remember, when you let the word of God go on richly and you know, that's what it converts you, that's what it will give you, you know, a, a clear sight and, and also just, if you don't have the word right there, look at his majesty all around you. So, right. so you're never alone, he's always with you. Psalm 19 is my favorite, and I love how the first half establishes who's in charge. You know, that God, that because the psalm, it's really about God's word. Um, it starts with the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. And to an astronomer, you know, that's awesome for me. But uh, as I look at it, as I think about the whole development of that psalm, it's really not about that. Uh, I mean, p part of it is, but it's really about the last half, which is the law of the Lord is perfect for surviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And it goes on like that about how the law of the Lord is wonderful. But the law means nothing if the person who puts forth the law doesn't have credibility. So the first half of that psalm establishes the credibility. This is God who created the universe, and there it's there for you all to see. And once we establish who's in charge, now here's his law, how wonderful it is. So, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, Dave mentioned Psalm, Dave mentioned many, uh, <laughs> Psalm 150, which is how Psalms ends. Uh, what a wonderful ending to the Psalm. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him his mighty, in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Is it a mystery why Dave likes this song? <laughs> the same reason I do, yeah. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, you mentioned Psalm 100, which is very similar. Uh, pra uh, praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Was that... Wait, I'm on the wrong one. Shout for joy to the Lord all the year. Yeah, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Yeah, and it goes on. Any others? Uh, you mentioned Psalm, Psalm 1. Psalm yeah. 1. Any others? Psalm 8. 23. 23. The 23rd Psalm yeah. that we used to memorize. Psalm yeah. mm -hmm. My kids love Psalm 117. Oh, yes. I think they do. <laughs> the 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 <laughs> Whereas Psalm 119 is the longest, Psalm 117 <laughs> is the shortest. <laughs> Praise the Lord, all ye nations, extol him, all ye peoples, for great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. And you've memorized that entire song. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the kids race. And they love, I, I just said a whole chapter of the Bible, so, uh, they love, and I love it, I mean, I mean, the content of it is wonderful, wonderful and concise, Psalm 117, the One, shortest chapter in the Bible, yes. Uh, yeah. 103. 103, praise, praise the Lord, Lord on my soul, soul and all Christ. that it, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. That's when you forget to pray for this your meal, you can do that afterwards. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Nice. <laughs> but when I was going through a dark time, that I memorized the whole song because uh, it just 
helped me so much. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, I still go back to it uh, because of uh, yeah what it teaches. Yeah. How good God is. That's that's been one of my favorites. Also, one of the Pastor I used to at the end always yeah. you know, just uh, pray it over us. So. That's right. Yeah. Any others? Stick out mm-hmm. in your mind. I know they're all wonderful. Um, okay. Well, um, 1040, you know, this is a good break. We haven't even gotten into interpreting the Psalms, reading the Psalms today, but this is a perfect stopping point for now. Uh, next time, we're going to get into applying, now, now that we have some knowledge of the, the literary features and how the Psalms are arranged, next time um, uh, we'll get into reading the Psalms today. Uh, where I'm going to go from there is, I have two different tracks and I'm not sure which way I'm going to go. I'm going to get it all in by the end of the six weeks, but uh, I might get into, or at some point I'm going to get into uh, Hebrew wis- wisdom literature, so Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and stuff like that. Or next week, I might, there's a, a video uh, that I want to show from a, uh, a Baptist preacher teaching about biblical interpretation. He does a wonderful job. And uh, I might show that. So I don't know exactly. His name is Bob Utley. And uh, Bob Utley, wonderful series that he has uh, that I stumbled on on YouTube. Anyway, I don't want to spoil it because then you're going to watch it and then you go, oh, I've it. <laughs> yes, it's like a 15 week series that he does, 11 weeks, something like that. Anyway, so uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next week. Either uh, either show his one of his videos or uh, get on with wisdom literature. But at the very least, we're going to uh, get into reading the Psalms today. So that'll do it. Um, any questions, thoughts, concerns?